Hello, and welcome back to another episode of The Buck Stops Here. I am here with Shekhar Gupta on an episode we're entitled, So You Think AI Won't Affect You. Uh, Shaker, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Oh, I'm 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 excited to be here with you. Um, you know, so a few weeks back, we received an email to from one of the fans of the show, uh, from a plumber in Florida. And if you're watching the show or listening to it right now, I'm speaking about your particular email. We received several others, and the plumber said, in no uncertain terms, "Yeah, AI, David, good job. It's never going to affect me." And I said, "Okay." We're going to get some people on the show this season to talk about that. And uh, so that's one of the reasons I'm so excited to have you here. So, Shaker, real quick, if you would just give us a rundown of, of who you are, where we can find you online, and your AI venture. Yeah, no. So my name is Shaker Gupta. I am uh, founder and CEO of My Animal. I'm found pretty much everywhere on LinkedIn or Twitter. So look me up on, uh, on LinkedIn, Shaker Gupta 01, I think is what that is. And uh, my company, My Animal, we developed um, an AI solution that analyzes a cattle's face, a picture just, and is able to early predict the health symptoms of that cattle. Two to three days before, even the pen riders who are riding around and, and their whole job is to see what cattle, what cow is sick, we're able to provide notifications two to three days before even they can tell. Oh, okay. All right. Now, let me stop you just for a second there. Okay. So here's what I'm trying to understand. So I understand that when um, when you raise uh, cattle, it's it's um, it's um, it's under like USDA um, approval or they have to – you have certain things with the health of the animals that you put into the food supply. And so right now, I've heard of a thing called like downer cows and things like this. These are cows who get into the food supply that maybe are sick or showing symptoms – and um, from what I understand, if you're a cattle rancher, um, then that could, if you have an animal that's sick, they could contaminate the entire herd or anyone they're, they're in the pens with, right? That's correct. That's correct. I mean, that, that, that's the biggest problem because, you know, in a, in a pen, usually they have 300, 400 cattle. So if one cow gets sick, the disease spread very quickly in that herd, in that pen. And since these cattle are bought and sold very frequently... You know, you may not know that you just sold a soon-to-be-sick cow to another ranch, and that cow goes to another ranch, and where they start spreading the disease as well. And that's why the outbreaks happen. And that's why we get the recalls many times in the summertime when you have those recalls coming in. Okay, but the thing is that the, the thing that I want to underline here is that when you have bad food in the food supply, people die. Absolutely. It's very bad. And not just from that, not just from a, the health and safety of the food supply. Um, if I'm a small family rancher, 300 cattle may be everything I have. Um, so you're telling me that I could get sick cattle in the herd, uh, not know that there's a disease animal in there, and I could have a completely botched I mean, an entire year of income could be wiped out. Is that correct? That's correct. That's correct. So, you know, just to treat an animal, I mean, um, a shot is about $30, so that's not a big deal. But you got to bring that animal back in the chute. Mm -hmm. And that's where the issue is because all that labor to bring the animal in the chute and give that the shot, that costs about $30, $40, $50. So you're looking at $80 or so per cattle, per incidence. Okay. So... Now, now this is the part I'm going to challenge you on, right? So you're using artificial intelligence to make this happen, right? So tell me, how does that even work? I mean, because I, I, I uh, as a plumber or someone else who maybe think that it doesn't involve, sorry, I'm just talking to you, just <laughs> taking a little shot at you, just kidding, okay? Look, everyone out there in business right now realize that it's going to impact, it's going to impact your industry in the next 24 to 36 months. And you have to recognize it's gonna happen. And Shaker here is an example of how this is amazing and how it can work. So I'd like to know a little bit more, Shaker, about the technology. Like, what did you do? What, what, where did this come from? Where did you come up with the idea of this? And how does the AI do this? Yeah, no, so I mean, I'm very passionate about this thing, uh, David. Um, you know, especially post COVID. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if you saw, you know, you walked in, even at Sam's and Costco's type big wholesale, the, the food shelves were empty. Yeah. Uh, you know, and that's just really very bad for us as a nation, as a, you know, first world new nation that we cannot even supply food to our own citizens. Um, you know, baby formulas were out. So people, you know, many of the infants were, were you know, less left with no, no baby powder. 
Uh, so biosecurity is, is a big deal. And then on top of it, when we get a bad quality of product, we consume it, and our human health, it's degraded. We got to go to the hospital. We as human beings, that when we get sick, we go to the hospital. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we you know take medicine to get better or whatever. But we don't care about where our food supply is coming from. So if we can make our food supply better, if we consume a better quality of product, our health is going to go up. And so what's the best way to make our food supply better is to make our food source better. And I live in Kansas City, surrounded by cattle all around, and we consume a lot of cattle products. So let's start off with cattle you know, my, my company, that na- I named my company My Animal is because I've got on a roadmap other types of animals in the future as well. And cattle is just a beginning. And, yeah, so, you know, so I'm, oh, it took me a while to, you know, kind of go around. And, 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 and I'm also a predictive modeling kind of person because once you detect something, it's already there. If it's there already, then you're just simply detecting it and the cattle is already sick. But if you can somehow predict something before the cattle gets symptomatic, before it gets sick, that's where you can have a real impact on lowering the cost, bringing the better quality of product, bringing the product that has less antibiotics. That's one of the, the, the biggest, uh, you know, a good thing about my, my product is that, that the cattle owners, the ranchers can target the use of antibiotics versus giving the antibiotics to every single incoming calf. Okay. So that's, um, I've got, wow, I just have like five questions that came out of this. So the overuse of antibiotics in our food supply has been, people have talked about the problem with um, multi-resistant strain um, um, pathogens, et cetera, um, because of the overuse of antibiotics. And then the cow supply and then our, um, our animal supply for our food supply is one of the biggest places they've been worried about that, number one. And so you'll see people um, all the time in the stores, they'll talk about not treated with antibiotics, or, but that's a more expensive process. And so because your, your thing uses AI to scan the kind of faces of these cows right. um, ahead of time, before they're symptomatic, you present symptoms in different ways. There are small symptoms, but the thing is, a lot of times there are symptoms that a machine or a computer could read, like vascular structure in their face, a high definition scan of a face or things like that. With their cattle, they're finding this days ahead of time before they would ever present where a That's human correct. would recognize that the cow is sick. That's correct. That also means from an interventionist medical standpoint that you can intervene generally with lower level treatments. That's correct. So if you've ever had the flu, they have a couple of different um, antivirals, Tamiflu being one of them, for example. And it's usually these, these antivirals reduce viral load in your system very early on. And what happens is you're able to shorten the course of the disease, and you're also able to shorten the contagion level of disease and passing it on other people. Obviously, in the pandemic, had we had some of the more advanced treatments that have come out very early on, we could have had millions of yeah. people less infected with COVID, et cetera, because you could have treated and intervened earlier. So what you're saying is using AI technology. And so because it's AI, it's learning from the different things, it's fine. Maybe it seems to present symptoms. So it's actually improving itself over That's, time. It's actually do, doing what AI is supposed to be doing. Because, you know, many times you hear people saying that, oh, I've got AI, but when they simply have machine learning product. There's a difference between machine learning and AI. So our product is actually evolving more so than what we trained on it. So if, we, if, if it would just do what we trained on it, it would be a machine learning product. Mm-hmm. But it's evolving. It's, it's seeing the changes itself, and it's training itself. That's where the AI part of it comes in. And that's where I'm very, very glad that that's what's happening, because that's even progressing faster than I could possibly imagine. So in theory, you could, and I'm not putting, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you could, your product itself could have other beneficiary um, offshoots from it that will emerge perhaps in the next three to six months. Is that correct? Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, that's, okay. you know, I mean, you look at, um, there is also a conversation going on in the world about methane emissions. Mm-hmm. Yes. And people say, well, cows, cattle industry is one of the largest pr- producer of methane gas. I've heard this. Right. So 
A sick cow emits more methane because it's belching more, it's farting more. Yes. The longer it remains sick, the more methane it emits. The sooner you can grab that cow and, and cure it faster, the, the methane emission goes down. So there is a correlation there as well for the greenhouse emission to have uh, um, early prediction on that cattle, isolate that cattle, treat it faster, and thus having a real impact on methane emission. See, um, I mean, this is, this is just, this is blowing my mind right now. If you're listening right now and you want to comment on this, how many of you, how many of you listening to the podcast right now ever thought artificial intelligence two years ago, how many of you ever thought, oh, it could revolutionize our food supply? I mean, I mean, a lot of us had these myths that we've created about artificial intelligence because of what's in movies and things like that. It's like, oh, it's all going to be Skynet, you know? Yeah. And the reality is very different. Um, AI, if used properly in the right hands like shakers, we could end up with a world where um, – I mean, you could you could literally have a multiplicative effect. Like this could make the food things we we revolutionized food industry through genetic crop engineering and things right. like that in the eighties and nineties. We've increased food yield. We've been able to cross pollinate plants and things like that, and uh, and then do actually genetic manipulation, not just like you know from a, a cross pollination and genetic diversity type standpoint. But we're able to increase our yields on existing farmland. We could actually do this in um, in a way that we've never seen before. Um, and help farmers, ranchers, and, and the humans at large, who we don't we don't really care always where the food came from, just how yeah. it gets there. But none of us want to have a recall that says, "Oh, there's a listeria in your ice cream, yeah. and ten people have died." Yeah, um, that is that is amazing. Yeah, I mean, so you know, IVF mm -hmm. is one of the biggest thing in in cattle industry. Really? Yeah, that's wow, and that's in vitro fertilization for those of you who are not uh, familiar with it, and a lot of. Um, Humans will go through this process a lot of times if you're having trouble conceiving and having a child um, where they watch you take an egg and a sperm and fertilize it and then implant it into the uterus of the, the, of the mother yeah. to have a child. Yeah, I mean, so, so think about it. So if the mother is going to be sick over yes. the next two to three days, well, the tests don't show that she's sick today. So you do IVF. Mm. Well, the mother gets sick, whether it's uterus infection or something else. So all the procedure that you did there, all thousands of dollars you spent on it, just goes to waste really fast. I had no idea IVF was being used in the cattle industry. Yeah. That's amazing. But it makes sense, right? Yeah. I mean, there, there was even a, a, a research done by, I want to say UPenn or something, that if you trace back the history of all these cattle, they go back to like a handful of bulls back in the uh, early 1900s. Wow. I mean, that's amazing. Okay, now I have another follow-up question for you. Okay, you said you've been looking at other industries, and I've been thinking about, just in particular, the poultry industry. Yeah. So a couple things happened in the poultry industry over uh, last fall. We had the egg prices went through the roof, and there were a whole bunch of um, – it was a multivariate problem. There were multiple reasons this happened. But one of the big reasons was wholesale um, – culling because of a bird flu, et cetera, being presented yep. and, and the different um, animals. So what, what kind of other industries have you been looking at? Yeah, no, so hogs is one of the, the, uh, the other ones. I've, okay. I've been reached by many people uh, about hogs. And then, um, as a matter of fact, somebody reached out to me from Middle East about camels. Really? Because they raise camels for beauty pageants. I had no idea. Wow. So... Yeah. So, I mean, camels is far out there, so I'm not putting that in there yet. Sure, sure. But sheep, goats, um, you know, hogs. I mean, think about, you know, pets. Mm -hmm. Think about that. People love their pets, their dogs and cats, and they take pictures of them all day long. Oh, wow. To put them on their social media. Wow. Now, how cool would that be that you took a picture of your dog or cat and right there – it shows that there's something is happening with it. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, keep going. There's there's so much here. Yeah. But you're talking about like – so out of the application on – you're looking at using artificial intelligence and diagnostic imagery. Um, and this is just photography of these animals. Um, you're talking about you could potentially revolutionize the entire veterinary and medicine industry in some way. Yeah. I mean and one of the examples that I like to give you here, David, is that – um, one of my customer uh, stated to me that that he had to adjust the feed 
he wasn't given a proper feed, so that was showing up on the cattle. And think about that. You know, that we're kept picking up not just the physical pain, but also the mental pain because they're eating a bad quality of feed, so it's showing up. Now, relate, relate that mental issues mm. to our humans. Absolutely. How easy of a leap would it be for me to get into a human world where we are having these mental issues um, a lot nowadays mm-hmm. to kind of d- predict that, that that something is going to happen, uh, you know, that child or that person is prone to have some mental issues. It's uh, it's amazing to think about all these things can be done. And it reminds me of, um, and so in the AI, um, in the literature, and I know we're in, we're in season three of the podcast now, and um, the three-part series I did in season two was pretty popular. And, um, and I've been thinking about going back and revising it because, I, I mean, I did it, I don't know, six or seven months ago now, I think, based on when this podcast is being recorded. So if you're listening to this next year, just pretend that I said that that was plus a year or whenever it is. But the point about it is, is that um, so much has changed. And I read, a, um, I think it was a five-year uh, longitudinal, longitudinal study of it as an onco- oncology report. And they were using AI to predict five-year survivorship outcomes based on the first intake with a patient. Before they've done any diagnostic imagery, before they've drawn the first uh, milliliter of blood. And what they discovered is that the AI models could accurately predict five-year outcomes based on the Ah. doctor intake. And that made me think, diagnostically speaking, there are so many more data points there that we as humans just aren't even observing. Yeah. And I've been thinking about your cattle example here. Like what's being presented right now with the pallor, the color of your face, whatever it is, versus some kind of baseline when you show up. And, and di- doctors are diagnostic. I mean, they're diagn- diagnosticians. They look at the what yeah. happens and they look at you and they say, oh, and, and, and you want a doctor to take kind of a holistic approach. You come in and you're not better and you're short of breath and you've got a a bad pallor and you're clammy and you're not really presenting a fever yet. All these data points, if you have a machine learning or an artificially intelligent model, and for those of you in the show who are not sure what the distinction is, machine learning is basically the machine being programmed with a certain set of data points. Um, It can make diagnostic things, but it's not really learning on its own. It's not generative. It can give you outcomes and humans kind of direct it. With AI, in theory, you can take a an AI that doesn't know how to play chess and buy and have it play itself. And by lunchtime, it can beat most beat most players in the United States. And by the end of the day, it can beat the grand champions of chess. Yeah. So it can learn from itself and figure out strategies. They have uh, Google has a lab at DeepMind where they have robots who are teaching themselves to play soccer. And they don't give them rules. They give them what the rules of the game are, but they give them the objective or the goal. And it comes up. They come up with entire strategies that we, as um, if you're a soccer fan or a football fan, if you're overseas listening to this, um, you know, they come up with strategies that the the top teams in the world took decades to to come up with, and they come up with it in a matter of weeks. Um, I've just been thinking about like how different this is. So I want to shift gears for just a second. Uh, my animal. Is an incredible, and we'll have it in the show notes down there on the show if you'd like to know about that. And we'll have information to get in touch with Shaker. If you are in uh, one of these other um, animal industries, we would appreciate you reaching out to him um, because he's going to be one of the people, one of these kind of leading lights trying to um, revolutionize these industries. And it could um, be a more optimistic view of the future in AI in particular. I want to talk to you a little bit about your personal background because this is the metal season of the, of the buck stops here. And so we want to talk about courage and adversity. And overcoming change. And so um, and so AI is the big thing right now. And in fact, I think this entire season is going to have a little bit of AI in every episode. But I want to know about your personal background and your journey. You are not just um, an AI technologist, and you are not somebody doing this, but you are somebody who's kind of a, a bit of a polymath. You've done a lot of different things at a very high level. You've got a book you published on Web yeah. 3, 3.0, yeah. Yeah. which for those of you out there, it's still coming. It's Web still, 3, not 3.0. Not 3.0, Web 3. Web sorry. 3. There's a huge difference sorry. between 3 and 3.0. Got it. Got it. So I'd like you to take a little bit a minute and, and would you share with the audience kind of your personal journey in business and kind of if you would share with us just kind of like how you got to here. Yeah, no, I mean, I started out, uh, you know, just as, as, as an engineer working for a large corporation. 
and, uh, you know, learning about things. And that's one thing that I've always kind of prided myself in is that I've never said that I'm a master of anything because there is just, as soon as you say you're a master, there's something else happens and you're like, whoa, I had never thought about it. You know, because one of the things that I've always known is that if you can think about something, there are a million other people who have not only thought about it, but have done something about it before you even thought about it. So, yeah, I mean, working in the technology field, I just absolutely love it, David. I mean, you know, I moved here from India. Uh, you know, I if I hadn't come here, I would probably be a doctor there because I was becoming an eye doctor there when I moved here. And my medical background wasn't really recognized here, so I would have to go back mm. to school again and did all that sort of thing. I'm like, yeah, I'm too old to go back to the school now. So I did my, uh, so I did my electrical engineering. So it was a big switch uh, from biology to physics and maths. I, was, I sucked at it in my first semester. But technology is something that I fell in love with after I got introduced to it. And whether I work for myself um, or work for a, a company, I've always come up with newer and innovative ways to develop a technology. I mean, you know, um, companies as big as Motorola, I worked for them, and it was, you know, one of the largest corporations when I did. And I was managing their digital rights management product back in 2011. And that's when I, you know, was constantly thinking, how do I secure this, 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 this content that I have? And that's when I was introduced to blockchain back then. So, you know, I've, I've been doing IoTs, Internet of Things, since the mid-2000, 2005 or six or so. I've been working in this AI field since about 20 or seven, 2007, 2008. And it's taking that long to come because there's so many things you've got to do. The, the, you know, these, all these concepts were there. It's just the technology to make them a reality just wasn't there yet. You know, I'm a big proponent of blockchain still. And I think when people get to see what the real use for blockchain is that it's not just an Excel sheet. It's not just um, a, a database. I mean, you can use IPFS all day long to do that thing. It's not that. There are specific use cases for blockchain. Once you start, start developing products in there, then it would make sense for you to stay on, on blockchain. Same thing with AI. You know, they're good or bad for everything because the tools that are available to good people, the same tools are available to bad people as well. Sure. But, you know, but, black, but AI can do so much, so many good things in the human world itself. You know, it can detect, in the, in the human world, you know, it can detect somebody's going to have a heart attack. Somebody's going to be having a dementia 10 years, 15 years down the road. I mean, how cool would that be that you have that knowledge there so you can take preventative measures, help that person before they get dementia. I lost my mom just very recently to dementia. She didn't know who I was. I mean, that's a lady who, you know, gave me birth and brought me up, and, and I loved her, and she didn't know who I was at the end. I'm so sorry to hear yeah, about Thank that. you, thank you. So, but, it, you know, these kinds of tools can really help lower those kinds of pains on not just a person who is suffering, but entire family that's suffering with that as well. You know, so there's so much good that we could do. It's not just Terminator coming, but it's just, you know, there's so many good things that you could do with, with, with the AI itself. And, and the sky is literally the limits out there. So I want to ask you a couple things. So it sounds like you were really felt called to move into this AI world based on your background in history. Yeah. So at what point? So my animal is a newer a newer venture, correct? It's right. in the past couple of years. That's correct. Right? So um, I would like to know about some of the challenges you've ever had to overcome. Like what things for the listeners out there right now? 
Um, and as we said, this is the metal season. Like, what kind of things do you, you say, man, I really have to have grit and determination. I got kicked in the teeth today. I got to pick myself up and do this. What kind of things have you run into? Yeah, no, I mean, it's, you know, just in my animal itself, right? So when I take that proposition to a rancher, mm -hmm. they're like fifth, sixth, seventh generation. They're like, we've never heard of anything like that. Oh, yeah. So this is not possible at all. So then I would then show them right there that, hey, you know, this is how it's done. And I would take a picture of their animal with their permission, of course, and then do the analysis right there to show them what the, the system is seeing. And so it took me some time to convince some people. And, uh, you know, and, and, and that's the, the, the biggest thing. I mean, you look at me, David. I don't look like a rancher. I don't talk like <laughs> one either. No, sure. You'd you be, you be a cowboy. We put a yeah. hat on you. <laughs> so, you know, that credibility was a, a major um, issue for me in there as well. So I had to really go find a champion or two that could help me with this cause. And I was able to find a champion that could believe what I was doing because they saw the results as well. Um, and you know, another time, and there was another time where I was too early in mm. the product as yeah. well. Yeah. So um, that's one thing that I would cautious people, your listeners, and everybody else is that is that make sure you're not too early because if you are, no matter how good that product is, it's not gonna go anywhere. It's a uh, you know it's something you kind of said. I was thinking about it the other day about how um, AI is everywhere right now, and AI systems. I mean, uh, at the original conference, I think in 1956 is where the ter term AI was born, and then there was kind of a, a an AI winner in the 1970s, and a little bit of revitalization in the 80s, and then a pullback. And now, I feel like this is kind of like starting a fire. It's like it takes so long before the logs catch. You know, the heat's building up, heat's building up, and then all of a sudden you have a roaring fire there. And I kind of feel like that's the moment the AI's done. But with, I mean, but without the growth, and this is a blockchain thing, blockchain supercharged video card technology and the amount of investment in NVIDIA in particular in TSMC producing yep. the chips, like yep. getting down to four nanometers and stuff like that. It's yep. just amazing stuff. But, but without blockchain, and I know it was a big villain for a while, right? I don't think we would be here with the uh, with the yeah, machines absolutely. and the volume of them. Yeah. The other thing I wanted to say on that, it, which is kind of interesting, and, and blockchain is coming, is that people don't see the rational application of blockchain. And you're an expert in blockchain. Um, and something I thought about the other day was they were talking about – so we've talked about the positive elements of AI a bit today and, and the possible doing things. One of the negative things about it possibly is people have talked about disinformation and, and deep fakes and things like that. Having these AI machines do really amazing, virtually identical fake pieces of content that people can't discern. And I was thinking about what about blockchain and using NFTs to fingerprint and identify those things yeah. so you could verify the source. Yeah. And I don't know that it's going to self-police. I've heard people say like, oh, we won't need that. Yeah. But I think, I think that would be a good application for blockchain perhaps. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely right. I mean, you know, you talk about NFTs, you know, it's mm -hmm. NFTs, as soon as people think of NFTs, they think of a bored ape yeah, picture. Yeah, the, the bored ape thing, which is not, that's not the practical application no, of it's it, not. right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, so that, that's that's the purpose of it. Um, you're absolutely right. I mean, there are, you know, AI brings a lot of these deep fake type concerns out there. And, you know, if, if we can roll that in the, the blockchain in the Web3 to provide that information, because... The systems that are creating deep fakes are also able to ascertain what is a deep fake anyways, what video is a deep fake. So it's not that hard, mm -hmm. you know. And yeah, I mean, if we can use the NFTs, blockchain kind of thing in there to help decipher, uh, you know, and provide that better information. I mean, even just in the pandemic time, we were we had gone through so much misinformation, and now even oh, now yeah. so, there's so much disinformation out there that it's very hard to know what actually is going on. And, you know, having the AI work with the blockchain, that would be really, really cool. And we're going to get there. I mean, there are companies out there that are using both of these to provide that kind of information to you. Now, something I've thought about, your technology sounds like it's um – it, it would lend itself to VR, AR very, 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 That's very shortly. 
So you could eventually, just spinning this out into the future a little bit, you could have a potential application where you could develop an application where the rangers could, because right now you're bringing hammer systems and putting them in the things, which you'd want, but you might have a, a diagnostic, the diagnostician thing where you could actually look at things on your phone in kind of an AR type environment or something like that. Or maybe remotely, you could have somebody monitor what's going on through VR. I don't know. What kind of future uh, things do you see maybe, not on your roadmap, but what would you see as other kind of applications or similar applications? Yeah, no, I mean, you know, you're absolutely right. I mean, VR is one of the biggest things that I'm looking at. Um, you know, for VR to actually happen, a lot of things have to change in that VR headset. Yeah. You know, right now the processing happens up in the, you know, in um, on on the device itself, mm-hmm. and that's why the device is so darn heavy and it yeah. requires yeah. a big amount of battery. You know, I hope and I'm wondering and I'm wishing uh, more than that as we continue with our telecom roadmap and providing that 5G capabilities and 6G beyond it, we can reach to the cloud much faster, no matter where we uh-huh. are. And that would take away the processing power from the VR headset to the cloud. So we would just have to communicate with it, but in a faster way, because 5G communication series, um, um, it is as fast and many, it's not as fast as fiber, but it's as fast as most uh, terrestrial copper connections, et cetera, or Ethernet, Cat 5, I guess, Cat 5. Not Cat 6 quite yet, but... but, um, so as these technologies become more available, and the price is driven down, That's correct. as these things become available, this is something that, and this, what your technology is, your technology in my animal, am I wrong? This is something accessible to the smaller farmer or smaller rancher. They don't just have to be a giant, um, a giant multinational conglomerate. Yeah, no, that's correct. I mean, think about that also. Um, the, the labor costs itself. So you have to hire a pen writer. You have to teach that person you know, and then after some time, that pen writer is able to go out and, and start producing. That time frame and then hiring a laborer is very, very hard nowadays. So you not only save money on the labor cost because my system is able to start producing right away, but in a smaller ranch, smaller farms where the profits are already low, you know, for them to hire somebody else just to, so that person can ride around, drive around, walk around, that becomes a very expensive proposition for them as well. So, you know, it can help in that scenario. So this brings me to the no BS segment of the show. And so for those of you out there listening and watching right now, what you need to understand is no bullshit, people. AI is here. It's going to be available in every industry. We've even talked about knowledge work. In the next 24 months, in America, there's 100 million people who are employed in the knowledge, working, or related industries. It's going to be integrated in most of those industries within the next 24 to 36 months. But if you're outside that realm, if you're outside what you traditionally say is knowledge work, let's say hypothetically the cattle ranching industry or the food production industry, if you're involved in any of these other related industries, you're going to run into an area where AI is also going to be involved in them. So CEOs out there and captains of industry and the small business owner, if you are not looking at AI today and saying, how can I put it in here? And you're not looking at this before the end of 2023, you're going to find yourself woefully behind second quarter of 2024. And that's your no BS segment for today. Yeah, I mean, the absolute right, sir. Um, you know, I mean, you think about back in like 1910, 1920s, people were riding around in their buggy carts. Yeah. And all of a sudden, cars started coming up. And that buggy cart industry evaporated just literally overnight. So, so here's, I want to take that a little bit further, okay? Think about the down-channel industry things that happen. Paved roads yeah. were required. These things, and a lot of times, were a lot heavier than the existing bug. And, um, and there were challenges with that, right? Yeah. But think about the entire thing, the interstate highway system that happens in the 1950s in yeah. the U.S. All these corollary industries. And I know there's a big question mark right now about AI wiping out jobs. And undoubtedly, it will remove some jobs. But there are a whole bunch of other corollary yeah. industries that could be created throughout this. What are other kind of industries as a, as a kind of a futurist? Because I'm, I'm putting you in that category right now, okay. Shaker, okay? As a futurist, what other industries do you think this is going to change just downstream? Yeah, I mean, you know, as you mentioned, AI is going to just 
be in every single industry. I don't know if there is any industry, any business that isn't going to be affected by it. Everything will be. So, you know, the best advice that I would say is, you know, start looking at how this AI, how this technology is going to change your industry because you should be able to disrupt your own industry versus somebody coming in from outside disrupting yours. And if you can disrupt your own business, if you can cannibalize your own revenue yourself, then you'll be in a much better shape than somebody else coming in and cannibalizing your, your business for you. So looking at in that prism and saying, how do I make my process, my work, my work, my company more accessible to the users, to the end users out there? And by the way, I've got this AI here that I can use to make that happen. So you may have cashiers, you know, cashiers job may, may be gone in a retail industry, you know, with the iPads and things like that. But there are still um, people that are that are needed to then assess, uh, make sure the, 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 the entire infrastructure works as well. There may be robots in the in the warehouses that are, you know, pr getting this stuff from the shelves to you um, on the conveyor belt, but there are still going to be people needed who are going to have to, you know, make sure that everything works um, in, in, in that fashion the way it's supposed to be. We talked about, you know, biases um, in, in AI being a, a major, you know, major hurdle to it. Well, we're, you know, right now we're relying on humans to provide, to label the data set, to train the, the, the system. And, and that's going to have to continue happen for some time for, before the AI takes over. Because, I mean, think about that. If we have a bias AI and then we let the bias AI to start providing data sets and start building it, that's not going to be all that, all that good as well. So having the regulatory committees, have, having and, – and that's where, you know, I really – I mean, we talked about, you know, having the blockchain integration with AI. Think about DAO, which is a part of Web3, Right. Um, DAO working in that regulatory industry to to have that kind of you know opportunities where the, you can then then train the AI based on what is the right information versus what you know what what do you what your personal beliefs are. So you know Futarchi is another one of the the the, the it's it's a voting ba base it's a democratic voting based system where you can actually have the consensus of a democracy provide that inputs to you, that you then you can create a DAO based on that, 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 that can help you build uh, an AI system. I mean, those kinds of things are just coming up. For my listeners out there, if, if, if there's, there's a lot here, and I know we're talking at a very high level in some respects, but for those of you out there who are worried about, and we'll just use this for example, um, factory jobs with a machine coming in and picking and pulling um, issue, or even having automated driving cars, the number one determining factor of car wrecks is the idiot behind the wheel. The number one determining factor is how many of you guys have been driving late at night, and you're like, I can close one eye. It's, I'm tired, but I'm not gonna pull, I'm gonna close one eye, oh, let me turn the air on high. And um, the fact of the matter is, is that the machines, they don't get tired. When they make mistakes, it's generally speaking, it's because they've been programmed and there's a human error involved in it. But statistically speaking, they're able to do the rote things that we as fleshy bags of mostly water. At some time at the end of the day, you get tired. I do not make the best decisions. How many of, how many of you guys talk about being hangry? That is an emotional response to being hungry. We all talk about that. The machines don't do that. They're not going to get mad at somebody just because I haven't eaten lunch at 12. And so what you have to think about is the overall flow through, because I want to go and make this very apparent. I think these, we should work with these machines, but recognize we should be servants of humanity. And in the long run, my thoughts on this, not to pontificate on it, is that think about the benefits. Think about what Shaker's doing here to change the cattle industry, how that benefits your kids at home who are eating those happy meals. At the end of the day, if we can reduce the number of errors, we can reduce the amount of excess human deaths from these things. And that means that your kids get to grow up and go to college and get to contribute to these things in the long run. There's a big, bright, beautiful tomorrow if we do the right things of this. And I think Shaker is one of those people leading the way on it.
Well, no, thank you. Thank you for the kind words there, David. Uh, you know, there's just so much to be done before we can finally say that we're getting there where we want to be. I'm not sure that we'll ever get there because it will continue to evolve in the ways that we would probably would have never thought about it. But the tools are there and they're becoming more accessible. And as they become more accessible, we can develop things for the betterment of humankind much faster than what we could have before. So I want to say a couple things, and I think that's a good note to end on. But Shaker, I want to say a couple of things. I want to say, first of all, uh, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you. Um, it was uh, really humbling, and it's really going to um, let us know about people in the plumbing industry understand that AI will affect things there. Uh, I'm just teasing. Look, in all good humor, <laughs> keep sending those responses to the podcast. It's very important to get your impact, and that changes the kind of guests we get on the show. If you want to see people, more people like Shaker, more people who are changing the industry and using business to be a great force for good, let us know in the comments. Let us know about the, the show. So your three takeaways for today, because we always promise, promise these. Number one, AI is here. It needs to be involved in your industry, and as a business owner, it is it incumbent upon you to start pushing the envelope and challenging yourself and saying, hey, how can I make this work in my business? Think outside the box. Think about things you haven't thought about. If you're a hairstylist, I'm just using a, an industry I was like, could it ever affect hair? I mean, think about how AR could show, uh, using augmented reality, you could show different hairstyles to people, but using an AI data set, it could make predictive models based on what you would look best in. Yeah. That's just an example. Thing number two to remember here is it doesn't all have to be Terminator. It's not all Skynet. It is a challenging technology. It is here, but there is a big, bright, beautiful future that we can achieve together by using AI if we use it responsibly. But it's important for you to be involved in the legislation and the regulation creation around these technologies as they become apparent. And the third thing is to remember that it is going to be challenging. You need to focus on the metal of yourself in your business, that ability to face adversity and change and do it with a glad heart and understand that we're all kind of beginners again. Another thing about it that Shaker said earlier is remember, sometimes it, it hurts to be too early, but right now, if you're not working on AI, it's going to be very easy to be too late. And with that, thank you again for coming to another episode of The Buck Stops Here. If you liked what you heard here, please give us a, a good review and rating on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to great podcasts. And let us know what you'd like to hear more of in the comments. Thank you so much to our guest, Shaker. And everyone out there, go out there, be awesome, and make it a great week.